In the heart of West Africa, in a region often overlooked in the global technological race, something extraordinary is quietly taking shape. A fully electric vehicle, designed, engineered, and manufactured in Burkina Faso, has made its debut. This is not a prototype to be shelved, nor a flashy concept for international auto shows. It is a working, road-ready vehicle with commercial ambitions, proudly named a Tawa. The emergence of a Tawa marks a significant turning point for the African continent. It is not simply about building a car. It is about reimagining Africa's role in the global economy, shifting from a continent that exports its minerals and talent to one that manufactures its own technological future. For decades, Africa has been central to the success of electric mobility, supplying lithium, cobalt, copper, and other critical minerals essential to battery production. Yet the continent has been largely excluded from the value-added stages of the global automotive industry. The unveiling of a tower challenges the status quo. Developed entirely within Burkina Faso, the vehicle is a sleek, smart electric car tailored to African roads and realities. It runs up to 330 kilometers on a single charge and can be recharged in just 30 minutes. Its features are modern and competitive. Touchscreen display, GPS navigation, Bluetooth connectivity, ABS brakes, traction control, and even solar-assisted charging capabilities. But beyond the features and figures lies a far more compelling story, one of industrial sovereignty, national pride, and continental aspiration. The production of a tower is a result of an ambitious domestic initiative that brought together engineers, entrepreneurs, and local institutions. Unlike most vehicles on the continent, which are imported in full or assembled from foreign kits, a tower is designed and manufactured in Burkina Faso. It is a car built not for foreign export but for local utility, affordable, durable, and compatible with the infrastructure and energy realities of the region. It is purpose-built for Africa by Africans. This achievement has caught many by surprise. Burkina Faso, a landlocked country of about 22 million people, has historically been marginalized in global innovation narratives. With limited industrial infrastructure and a low manufacturing base, it was not seen as a likely contender for leading Africa's transition into electric mobility. Yet it is precisely this underestimation that makes the launch of a tower so symbolic. It disrupts conventional wisdom about who gets to build and who gets built for. But a tower is more than a national success story. It sends a ripple across the continent, inviting African nations to reconsider their place in the automotive and renewable energy supply chains. If Burkina Faso can build an electric vehicle suited to its needs and resources, why not Ghana, Nigeria, or Kenya? The logic is compelling. Africa already holds the raw materials. Its youth population is increasingly tech-savvy. Its roads, cities, and climates require localized design. The pieces are there. What has long been missing is the political and infrastructural will. That may now be changing. Other African countries have already begun moving in this direction. Zimbabwe, for instance, has banned the export of raw lithium, forcing companies to invest in local refining. Zambia is actively pursuing battery and EV production projects in partnership with the Democratic Republic of Congo and the African Export Import Bank. Ghana is refining its gold and diversifying its industrial base. And South Africa, the most industrialized country on the continent, has committed over 1 billion rand toward incentivizing domestic EV and battery manufacturing by 2035. These shifts are not isolated. They are part of a broader continental awakening, a realization that Africa can no longer afford to be a passive resource base for the rest of the world. For too long, global industries have depended on African minerals while excluding the continent from the rewards of technological production. The electric vehicle revolution, which relies heavily on cobalt from Congo and copper from Zambia, risks becoming just another chapter in this extractive dynamic, unless African nations intervene, as Burkina Faso has. Of course, such interventions are not without complications. Itawa's launch has not been free from criticism. Online commentators have speculated that the vehicle may not be entirely original, pointing to design similarities with existing Chinese or Indian electric cars. Some have suggested it may be a licensed rebrand or an assembly of foreign parts rather than a wholly indigenous product. But this critique, while worth examining, misses a more important point. Technological sovereignty does not require starting from scratch. Many industrial powers, 
including Japan and South Korea, began by adapting and licensing foreign designs before developing proprietary technologies. What matters is ownership of the process, adaptation, assembly, repair, and continuous improvement. If Burkina Faso is mastering these steps, then it is building something real. Even if some components are foreign, the knowledge and capability to integrate them into a coherent, roadworthy product is a major leap forward. Moreover, the car's design, charging system, and performance specs have been optimized for Burkina Faso's specific environment, an effort rarely made by foreign manufacturers. The integration of solar charging, for example, reflects a clear response to local energy availability. Similarly, the car's rugged build and simplified maintenance structure speak to an awareness of the challenges faced by African drivers. Perhaps most importantly, Itawa is not just a product. It is a platform. It creates jobs in engineering, design, manufacturing, distribution, and repair. It seeds industries around charging infrastructure, battery management, and software integration. It inspires students and young professionals who now see a future in STEM not as an escape route to Europe or Asia, but as a viable path at home. In a country where youth unemployment is high and industrialization remains a challenge, the importance of such symbolism cannot be overstated. The vehicle also raises serious questions for the global automotive industry. What happens if more African countries decide to follow Burkina Faso's lead? What if the continent, instead of exporting cobalt and copper at low prices, begins refining and using them to build its own vehicles? What if African governments introduce export bans on raw minerals unless foreign companies establish local factories? The implications for global supply chains are profound. Already, some international players appear to be responding. Diplomatic overtures from Japan to Zambia, including renewed interest from Toyota, hint at concerns about Africa's changing posture. These moves may aim to preempt a kind of resource nationalism that could alter access to critical minerals. Yet such engagement also opens new doors for mutually beneficial partnerships, ones that value African industrial agency rather than treat the continent as a mere quarry. Still, many hurdles remain. Building an automotive industry requires more than innovation. It demands stable electricity reliable transport infrastructure, access to finance, and a coordinated supply chain. Political instability, corruption, and logistical constraints have derailed past industrial efforts across Africa. But the current moment is different. The alignment of global energy transitions, youthful demographics, and digital connectivity offers a window of opportunity that did not exist in previous decades. The rise of a tower captures that window. It is at once a humble electric car and a powerful metaphor, a glimpse of what is possible when African countries believe in their own capacity to build. The road to full industrial sovereignty is long and filled with obstacles, but begins with such milestones. Burkina Faso's electric vehicle is not just about transportation. It is about transformation. It speaks to a generation ready to redefine African modernity on its own terms. It questions the logic that technological progress must be imported, and it asserts that the continent most essential to the 21st century economy should no longer be treated as its forgotten supplier. As the Itawa moves from factory to showroom to open road, it carries with it more than passengers. It carries the weight of ambition, the promise of self-determination, and the early signs of an industrial era led not by extraction, but by innovation. Whether or not it becomes a bestseller is almost beside the point. What matters is that it exists and that it was built not in Stuttgart, Detroit, or Shanghai, but in Ouagadougou. Africa is no longer simply fueling the machines of others. With a tower, it has begun building its own, and in doing so, it has taken the wheel of its own future. The streets of Ouagadougou buzz with electricity that had nothing to do with power grids when Burkina Faso unveiled its first domestically produced electric vehicle earlier this year. The Itawa sedan, rolling off assembly lines in the capital's modern Waga 2000 district, represents far more than a new transportation option for this West African nation. Its very existence challenges decades of economic orthodoxy that position Africa as merely a supplier of raw materials while advanced manufacturing happened elsewhere. With its 330-kilometer range, solar-integrated roof, and suite of smart features, 
This vehicle engineered by Burkinaby technicians signals that the continent is ready to compete in high-tech industries on its own terms. What makes a Tawa truly remarkable isn't just its specifications. Though they impress with 30-minute fast charging, adaptive traction control for rough terrain, and Bluetooth-connected diagnostics, the breakthrough lies in its origins. Unlike previous African automotive initiatives that merely assembled imported kits, this project began with Burkinaby engineers at the National Center for Scientific and Technological Research designing the platform from the ground up. They adapted global EV technology to Africa's unique conditions, the punishing rural roads, the inconsistent charging infrastructure, the tropical climate, while utilizing locally sourced materials wherever possible. Aluminum from Burkinaby mines forms parts of the lightweight frame, while regional rubber plantations supply components for vibration dampening. We're not just building a car, explains lead engineer Dr. Amanata Awadrogo, her hands still bearing traces of grease from the factory floor. We're building an entire ecosystem of skills, suppliers, and supporting industries that will transform our economy. The economic implications ripple far beyond Burkina Faso's borders. Early estimates suggest the Atawa project has already generated 2,300 direct jobs and an estimated 8,000 indirect positions in everything from lithium processing to charging station installation. Perhaps more significantly, reduced dependence on imported fossil fuels could save the nation $150 million annually. Crucial savings for a country where energy imports consume nearly a quarter of the national budget. Local manufacturing of components from wiring harnesses to battery casings, is spawning new supplier industries where none existed before. Small workshops that once repaired aging gasoline cars are now being trained to service advanced electric drivetrains. This destroys the myth that Africa must wait for foreign investors to industrialize, notes development economist Professor Kwame Asani, who has studied similar technological leaps in emerging economies. When you combine local knowledge with global technology and adapt it to African realities, you get something truly transformative. Burkina Faso's breakthrough comes amid a broader African industrial awakening that's quietly reshaping the continent's economic landscape. South Africa has launched a $68 million EV manufacturing incentive program, aiming to leverage its established automotive sector into the electric age. Zimbabwe now bans raw lithium exports entirely, forcing mining companies to process the battery-critical mineral domestically. Ghana has established gold refineries to capture more value from its mineral wealth, while the Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia are collaborating on a battery belt initiative supported by the African Export-Import Bank. These developments share a common thread. After decades of watching their mineral wealth, 75% of the world's cobalt, 50% of manganese, and significant lithium and copper reserves Fuel industries abroad, African nations are finally demanding a seat at the manufacturing table. The Itao announcement sent shockwaves through global corporate boardrooms and foreign ministries alike. Leaked diplomatic cables reveal frantic activity in response to Burkina Faso's announcement. Toyota has reportedly accelerated negotiations for a Zambian battery plant, while European Union officials have proposed new partnerships with African lithium producers. Chinese firms, long dominant in Africa's EV markets, are suddenly offering unprecedented technology transfers to maintain their market access. This is exactly what we feared, confessed a senior auto executive speaking on condition of anonymity. Once one African country proves it can be done, the whole dynamic changes. It's not about charity or development aid anymore. It's about competition. Yet not all observers are convinced that Atawa represents the clean break its boosters claim. Critics point to undeniable similarities between the vehicle's chassis and existing Chinese EV designs, raising questions about how much is truly original engineering versus strategic adaptation. The project still depends heavily on imported semiconductors and rare earth elements, highlighting Africa's continued gaps in certain advanced manufacturing sectors. And without large-scale crash test data or long-term reliability studies, some automotive analysts remain skeptical about claims of technological parity. Let's be realistic, argues Michael Schmidt, a Johannesburg-based automotive analyst. No country develops full EV capabilities overnight. This is likely strategic assembly with some local components rather than pure indigenous innovation. 
but that doesn't make it any less significant as a first step. Indeed, even skeptics admit the symbolic power of an African-designed EV rolling off an African assembly line. Whether it's 30% or 90% local, Itawa changes a conversation from what Africa can't do to what it might achieve, observes Lindai Mazaboko of the Africa Business Network. She points to similar journeys in other developing regions, how South Korea's automotive industry began with license production before developing its own world-class brands, or how China evolved from assembling foreign phones to dominating global electronics manufacturing. The path from technology adopter to technology innovator is well-trodden, and a tower may represent Africa's first confident steps on that journey. For this momentum to translate into lasting industrial transformation, several critical challenges must be overcome. Scaling production from hundreds of demonstration vehicles to tens of thousands of commercially viable units will test Burkina Faso's manufacturing infrastructure and supply chains. Creating cross-border component networks through the African Continental Free Trade Area, EFCFDA, could help, but requires unprecedented regional cooperation. Political continuity poses another hurdle. Will future governments maintain support if immediate profits prove elusive? And perhaps most fundamentally, Africa's education systems must rapidly expand technical training to feed the growing demand for skilled engineers and technicians. The vehicle itself is just the start warns Carlos Lopez, former executive secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. The real test is whether African leaders will make the hard choices needed to sustain this momentum through multiple election cycles and economic cycles. As the first Atawa models begin navigating Ouagadougou's bustling streets, dodging motorcycles, and navigating the red laterite dust that coats everything during the dry season, they carry the weight of continental aspiration. This is no longer about proving whether Africa can manufacture advanced goods. That question has been answered. The issue now is how quickly and how widely these capabilities can spread across a continent of 54 nations with varying levels of infrastructure, governance, and human capital. Success could see Africa capture meaningful shares of the $7 trillion global EV market developing homegrown renewable energy solutions tailored to its needs, and fundamentally reshaping trade patterns that have persisted since colonial times. For generations, they told us what we couldn't do, reflect Burkinabee entrepreneur Fatimata Soadogo as she watches workers install a new charging station outside her textile workshop. Now we're showing what we can, not because we're special, but because we've decided our future won't be written by others. In factory yards across Ouagadougou, workers gather around newly delivered battery packs, their protective goggles reflecting the glare of the Sahelian sun. At technical schools, students pore over wiring diagrams that might have seemed like foreign artifacts just years before. And at government ministries, policymakers debate how to nurture this fragile industrial seedling into something that can weather global competition. The revolution, it seems, has already begun not with grand pronouncements or violent upheavals, but with the quiet hum of electric motors and the determined clatter of tools and workshops where Africa's industrial future is being forged one bolt, one circuit board, one bold idea at a time. 